Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly talk about Salman Rushdie's collection of essays, Imaginary Homelands. And I'll focus primarily on the titular essay, Imaginary Homelands. Uh, for some reason, quite a few of you, through the comments, have requested me to record a lecture on imaginary homelands, and it is always mentioned uh, alongside Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. And I think there is a slight misconception as if these both these books are dealing with issues of nationalism. Actually, Benedict Anderson, and I have a full lecture on him, uh, is a monograph. It's a scholarly book about theorizing nationalism, whereas Imaginary Homelands, on the other hand, is a collection of Salman Rushdie's public writings from 1981 to 1991. So that means it covers his early career, starting from Midnight's Children, and then towards the end of it, it mostly deals with the publication of the Satanic Verses and its aftermath. By the way, in my forthcoming book, Democratic Criticism, Poetics of Incitement. One whole chapter of my book is dedicated to one of the essays in uh, Imagined Communities, and when the book comes out, I'll talk more about it. But today I'm going to briefly talk about his first essay in this collection of essays, which is entitled, of course, Imaginary Homelands. Now, this essay was written if you look at the date of its publication in 1982, and it was written after the publication of Midnight's Children. Now, those of you who are familiar with Salman Rushdie already know that Midnight's Children was his first major work, um, which uh, also won the Booker Prize, which is now called the Man Booker Prize, but also a highly, uh, what would you call it, regarded novel. I've taught it several times. And it's a novel that retells the story of Indian independence, right? That, and so it's a, you could call it a novel of India. It actually um, starts the so-called genre of writing the novel of India. So what he's doing in this uh, essay are, uh, several things, but I think the most important thing that he's trying to articulate is the role of the so-called British Indian author. Who is a British Indian author, and how do they go about doing their work of writing, right? But also the question of memory. How does it work? So if you read the essay, it starts with an anecdote, right? Rashti is visiting Bombay. That's where he was born and had his early education and early life before he moves to England to study. And he starts with a picture of his ancestral home, right? Describes it and then tells the readers that when, when he was in Bombay, after a long hiatus, long enough that he himself could be considered a foreigner in Bombay, he goes and sees the house which is still there but he doesn't dare to enter. And that's where he tells us about part of the reason, part of the hesitance is, of course, he doesn't want to go in and see how the new owners have changed it. But what he also recalls of his time in Bombay is that now that he is in Bombay, the Bombay that he imagined or remembers is completely different from the actual Bombay that he is in. And that's the question of memory, right? Do we actually always access the real memory? Or part of it is what we construct through different fragments from our childhood. And he uses an example from the novel itself because he's trying to explain how he wrote, how he created the character of Salim, Salim Sinai. And what he's saying is that he character, the character is constructed out of these fragments of memory, right? And he uses a passage from the novel where uh, Salim Sinai is saying, well, when you look at a movie screen, right, the farther you are from it, the clearer it is. But as you go closer and closer and closer and put your nose next to the screen, all you will see is dots. 
and Rishti is also trying to explain that maybe when you deal with the memory, as you move from a past to the very immediate present, it's while trying to represent the immediate present that you are actually not really clear, but also it can be complicated because the actual politics of the time in which you are writing then get incorporated within your writing style, right? Um, then he goes on on page 13 to the question of what does literature do, and I'll read a bit. Does literature seek, uh, what he's trying to say it, um, is that what does literature do? Let's say what does a novel about India do? Is it mainly just descriptive, right? Of course not. But what he's saying is, I must say first of all that description is itself a political act. Now what he's trying to say is that even if you're trying not to be political, when you're writing a novel, politics is a part of it. The mere act of describing India right, in a novel written in English is a political act because the question is whose description will you rely on, right? Is it your own imagination, right? If it is your own imagination, where does it come from? Is it a Indian expat, now British, right, living in England, writing about India? Does it rely on the romantic views of India as internalized by British colonizers and even some parts of British uh, culture now? Uh, depending on whose point of view you're using to describe a place, of course, the politics of that location will be a part of your representation, your description. So. Another thing that he points out is the, the ability of literature to juxtapose a different truth, right, against the official truth, against the official statements. So he gives the example of the emergency as it was, uh, you know, declared by Ms. Indra Gandhi, right, in our second term. And he says, okay, here is an interview of Gandhi where she says, well, nothing bad happened during the emergency. But on the other hand, what he's saying is literature, his novel, the way it treats the emergency or the way other authors have done it, they can offer alternative facts, alternative experiences and ways of looking at it, thus complicating the official story, the official narrative. He uses another example uh, of the independence of Bangladesh, right, A and uh, the invasion of Bangladesh or the fight there by Pakistani troops. So there is a Pakistani official claim about no atrocities happened or nothing of that sort happened. But then in a work of fiction, you can also represent what actually did happen or, you know, what was the experience of Bengalis themselves. So in the act of representing that alternative reality, literature by its very nature becomes political, right? Uh, then he goes into the question of identity. What is it that we can call an Indian writer living in England, right? Part of it is, could we are they purely Indian? Of course not. Can they retrieve that kind of identity? Certainly not. Where Rushdi is headed in this essay is where he has always pointed us, and that is that identity can be complex. You can be born in England of Indian parents, speak perfect English, go to English schools, but still reserve the right to retrieve and articulate and play with your own heritage in your art especially, in your writing. Now what he's also pointing out is that the English writers have always done that, right? The Caucasian authors, may they be in America or elsewhere, they automatically lay claim to the world's heritage. They incorporate it unapologetically in their writings, right, in their novels. So why is it that if an Indian author decides to use Indian tropes or Indian history, that is problematic. So what he's encouraging is that absolutely use 
the history of your native cultures, where your parents came from, where you came from. Absolutely use it, but maybe use it more imaginatively. And the example is, of course, the Midnight's Children, which is a story of India, its history, right? Its colonization and eventual freedom told from the point of view of, of a deeply problematic, fragmented character. Then he also give, uh, answers, uh, gives an answer to a certain kind of criticism from India that Midnight's Children is a dark book and there is no hope in it. And what he's trying to suggest uh, by way of an answer is that, yes, yeah, Salim Sinai's character you know, is a tragic character, but the novel is full of possibilities for India, alternative and others, and so he sees it as a hopeful novel. And then he also mentions at a point in the essay that he didn't have a, an audience in mind, right? But he would have been disappointed if the novel had been dismissed and not accepted in India. So maybe there was a hope in his writing that the Indian readers would also appreciate the novel. And then he goes to, towards the end, he goes to a very crucial point about expat identity, right? Identity of living in exile. And that is what he's saying is that we should avoid, and I'm using his term, is ghettoizing our identity. By that, what he means is that don't live in England and just live in your own little Indian community, right? Live in there, maybe, but also open up to wider options, right? Open up to what's around you, the larger culture that surrounds you, which should then help you create an identity, maybe, that is more cosmopolitan, right? But which still retrieves the past of your parents or your own past if you moved as a young adult to any of the metropolitan cultures. So these are some of the thoughts in the essay on imaginary uh, homelands, right? Main essay in it. Now, we can apply it to any diasporic authors, people like me who may not be creative writers but who work you know, on literary studies is that we, we do adopt these identities where we rely constantly from on the cultures and stories of our native culture, but we don't just let those stories define us. Part of who we are is our lived experience, right? The problems that we face, the issues, right? But also the possibilities that are there for us to create the kind of work that bridges this gap, right, between two worlds, historically, but also in contemporary politics. So overall, uh, I do recommend this uh, book to anyone who's interested in Rushdie's public writing, especially from the beginning of his career as a writer, but also as he enters the heart of what is called the Rushdie Affair after the publication of the Satanic Verses. And you will see, uh, you know, just like his mercurial self, Rushdie can also be sometimes self-contradictory. Now, uh, you will also see uh, an incipient disdain for Pakistan. I mean, Rushdie obviously has his personal reasons for it. Maybe he never liked the idea of uh, division of India into uh, India and Pakistan, whatever his reasons, but that's peculiarly clearly there in his creative work, but also in his critical work. And you can see that the second no novel that follows Midnight's Children is Shame, which is about Pakistan, and it is a thoroughly unhappy and dark novel. And I do recommend that you should read it. Uh, but that uh, bias is there in Rushdie's writing. Also keep in mind that uh, Rushdie, as a public writer, you know, constantly questions this idea of authenticity. You know, he's a strong proponent of hybridity uh, or, or, or melange that he calls of identity, but also his works. And just in this essay, if you look at his references, right, uh, most of the references are Western, but within that there is a 
range, right? There is your Borges, right? There is Gunther Grass and all the other people that he cites. There is a slight dig at V.S. Naipaul, too, because there is a sentence where he says, we don't even know who he is, you know, Indian, Indo-Trinidadian, an Englishman. But overall, this book, but this particular essay, I think, is, is a good uh, insight into how Rushdie thinks what is the role of an Indian author living in England? What kind of identities can they inhabit? How can they retrieve this fragmentary past and represent it in a fictional world, knowing that there is no real access to that past, right? And then how can art, literature itself, politically, offer alternative narratives, maybe the truth itself, right, against the official narratives of, na of nationalism or official narratives of regional histories and global histories. So these are some of my thoughts on Salman Rushdie's imaginary homelands, especially the titular essay in it. If you have any questions and comments, please feel free to share them in the comment section. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so, so that you get the notifications of new things that uh, we are publishing. Please also note that we now have a full website, masudraja.com, where we have developed different kinds of courses for students and scholars alike. Please do give it uh, a shot and do look it up. And overall then, I will stop here. Thank you so much for your time, and as always, stay safe in this pandemic, and thank you, and peace and love.